Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Citizen's Corner. Of course, with me, as always, my bastion of common sense and guru of all knowledge in the universe, Lightning Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> More like Google of all the information. <laughs> Google of all knowledge. <laughs> um, yeah, so first of all, before we get started into this, I want to go ahead and let you know that there is a video that I did a voiceover for. Uh, it's called Field of View Gimbal Discussion. It's by Crimson Target. I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, leave a link down in the description below it's basically a description of both sides of the uh, gimbal issue with interactive mode and you've got contributors from both sides of the debate and if you're interested in learning more about the situation then feel free to check out the video very cool so let's go ahead and jump into it uh, of course I've been gathering up some questions so some of these may be a couple weeks old but hey that doesn't change if they're relevant or not so let's start with uh, one of my favorite questions which was by punk hunter 25 I wanted to call him pack hunter for some reason <laughs> <laughs> anyway read the question punk hunter 25 says I have another orc question for you guys what do you think of these giant orcs and umbrella corporations setting up for star citizen Will they be a problem in the persistent universe? I'm the XO of a small mining org, and we've been getting several offers to merge with bigger groups. We don't think it's smart to consider such an offer until the game is released, but the offers keep rolling in. I'm afraid of disappearing within the larger group, and don't want just a few orgs controlling the galaxy. I figured that you guys would know better than me since you have some EVE experience. That's a pretty solid question. Uh, my brother and I were part of a very small organization, and intentionally so. Uh, there's always the opportunity to join large organizations or uh, umbrella organizations with, you know, many of the smaller ones underneath being part of the larger. We were very independent. We had our own space station, we had base hidden out in the middle of nowhere. We did our own mining. We did everything together. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to such things, of course. But personally speaking, I find the advantages are greater than the disadvantages. In a game like Star Citizen or EVE, there's going to be the potential for espionage. The potential for people to infiltrate organizations and jack with you. To me, in some regards, the more connections you have, the more strangers you have walking in and out of your place of business, so to speak, the greater the risk is that someone's going to undermine what you're trying to do. Now, maybe that's a pessimistic point of view, but I also find that you might be calling yourself uh, to yourself a lot of uh, undue attention maybe you may not want. So I guess it comes down to personal preference, what you feel is risk versus reward. Personally speaking, I prefer quality over quantity. Uh, I've been part of large organizations, I've been part of small organizations, and to me, Every single time it comes down to it, I'd rather have a tight-knit group of people that I know, I can trust, and we have mutual um, goals in mind. Now, I don't know, Lightning, if, if you feel the same way or you kind of like think the large umbrella organizations are a good idea. <laughs> well, I actually have uh, both sides of this experience when I was playing EVE. So when I first started playing EVE, it was pretty much trust no one, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and in when you first start playing Eve, you have like this noob chat or whatever. Um, and I kept it open. I missed that. I was... That was that was fun. They cut it off at a certain time. Before that, you could help people. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, it goes away. Um, they had like a, a custom channel you could join um, that was like intermediate, and it was open forever. Uh, but you had to like join it. Um, but I, I had been reading that when I play, you know, doing like missions, doing mining and stuff. As I just kind of learned to play the game, and. Um, I don't know exactly how it started, but I got chatting with someone who was like, oh yeah, I'm part of this this small guild, you know, we got like, maybe they had like 12 members or something. Yeah. And um, he was he was talking about just different ships and things, and he helped me out quite a bit, so it's kind of like, well, you know, you know, I don't, I have no problem, you know, you know, joining this guild or whatever, just know that I'm really new to the game. He's like, no, that's fine, it's whatever, you know, I, I got the same ship as you now, because I think it was the, the Drake. Uh, the battle cruiser. I had basically just unlocked it, and um, we ended up doing quite a bit of stuff together. And uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I started taking skills for hauling, so that when because uh, he had a bunch of mining skills, and uh, I think we were mining ice, 
and uh, basically he was mining ice and we had like two or three people myself included that were running the ice back to the station and just dropping it off and uh, we had a lot of fun um, but it kind of like eventually like certain people like couldn't play anymore I mean it, it, it's real life uh, so that, that kind of stuff just happens and we ended up being pulled into a different organization um, that I think he was friends with some of the people. So he's like, you know, these are all good people. We're going to be merging with them because I just don't have the time to play anymore. I'm pretty sure it was him who was friend at a time. So it's like, well, that kind of sucks. But, you know, I'm still enjoying the game. I've, I'm up to battleships and stuff now, so I don't really need the help as far as what I was doing in the game. So the org we merged into, I want to say it was about 100 people. Um, but like, not everybody played all the time and they were all in different areas. So it wasn't really that bad. Um, I almost rarely interact with anybody there, and that goes to just being kind of how I am. I'm actually kind of a shy person. Like, I, it took a lot of courage for me to even start doing the YouTube stuff like two or three years ago, um, and um, so I don't interact with people a lot. Um, so when I was in this huge organization, I really didn't talk to anybody. Like, I'd say some stuff sometimes, but for the most part, I was just kind of like a fly on the wall. And eventually. Um, that guild joined with an alliance of like three or four other uh, really large guilds. So we ended up being... Now, I'm not trying to make this sound like braggy or anything, but our alliance was like one of like the five or something biggest alliances in the game at the time. I mean, it turned out huge. And I was like, holy crap. And then there was like we had like like hundreds of people, and we had like a, a a team speak channel where you'd have like twenty or thirty people in there, and then we ended up having this war deck on us, and it's kind of like oh crap, well what do we do? And it's like oh don't worry about it because they can't really do anything in, in high high sec or oh wait well now they can. <laughs> you know that's so actually good. Like, that's a good point. I mean I don't I know Star Citizen is not going to have war decks, but. To a degree, kind of. I mean, if you're part of a larger group or an umbrella and they they get into an argument with another larger group or, or equally large group and you're in a part of that as a, a subsidiary of that large group, then you're going to have to deal with the fact that you're now a target. Yep. And, and that's, and you know, if you're just a small group that's a subsidiary of a larger group, then, you know, in some respects, you could be sitting there with like you, you were 10 Mind or 20 your of your business. Yeah. And suddenly you're getting jumped because because your mat your umbrella group is is under under you know and you're not you, you can't handle it you're not you're not prepared for it or you don't want to deal with it maybe maybe you just want to be out there mining you don't want to deal with uh suddenly having a, a whole fleet jump in to pound on you because you know and that, and that that is another disadvantage actually uh by far is that you know you do open yourself up to being associated with uh what could be a major target that's a that's sorry i saw a sideline there but when you mentioned war decks i was like oh yeah that's a yeah 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 um but it's kind of like the I only went out on like two actual like sortie missions that I can remember. Uh, one of them was a huge monstrous fleet battle where we had like a couple hundred, I'm um, literally like a couple hundred battleships, you know, maybe a hundred um, battle cruisers. I was, I think I was in my battle cruiser. Uh, I don't know if I had my battleship at the time or I didn't take it rather. And we had a whole bunch of logistic ships. Um, and we had this big just slug fest, you know, Eve battles where you just like, you know, blobbing each other. And um, they had more repair ships than us. I think we had like five and they had like seven or eight. And so we couldn't repair as fast as they could. So we, we basically just lost the fight. So we had lost like 200 plus ships, like 250 ships or something in this in this battle. So it was like, wow, that really sucked, you know? And I didn't get any compensation for losing my ship. None. So it was like when that happened it's kind of like okay i think i'm done with the alliance stuff because if they're not gonna pay for me to lose my ship i i don't need to give them my ship right right no i agree i i mean there's a certain amount of responsibility that an organization has to take for its actions and you know once again that that goes back to the idea of, of small and independent um you know in a small group you can kind of all work together towards a, a very common mutual goal like as I mentioned a while ago, that my, one of my goals, since I have as many ships as I do, uh, is to get lightning uh, a javelin, and that's <laughs> that's that's one that's actually an honest to goodness goal. Um, 
not I don't know if it's gonna have guns on it or not, but we'll have to see how much money we put together. But that that's kind of a, a that can become an organizational goal. I mean, that could be like you know, ten or fifteen people pull together resources to try to get uh, a, a javelin, ship. yeah, or a capital ship who's going to be captained by one of the senior officers in the guild or something along those lines, and you know, that's just it's just it's one of those things that uh, a small organization I feel that that can they can take small what well, well, that would be considered a pretty large goal for a small organization. It probably a small goal for a large organization, but I don't know. I I, I think it'd be a lot of fun to to kind of have that 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 tight that interpersonal kind of goal setting that you do with, with a small group uh, to work towards those kind of things together. And you but just don't that, get that um, from large organizations. You just don't. That 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 war thing works both ways. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're yeah, small, yeah, if you're, getting a, you're it, technically a target. Um, and if you're big, you're also a target, but you have more people to protect you. But with Star Citizen going on, which I think is what uh, our, our guild is going to be trying to do, um, or at least the players we're going to be playing with, is... We're going to be, like, I guess mercenaries. <laughs> think, of, think of, like, mech warrior or whatever, right? Um, and and we're, we're not going to let that kind of crap stand. So, you know, if people are like, there's a trade guild or something. And they're like, oh, we got a really big, you know, hall or whatever. It's like, you know, well, hang on. We'll come with you as escorts or whatever. And who knows how money will be divided in the game. I mean, we don't even have, like, trading yet. Yeah, um, we're less than a week out from potentially from Evo Cotti. So yeah, oof. so that's kind of one of the things is like that's probably what we're gonna be doing. But I think for the most part, uh, our organization is gonna be mining and salvaging. Yeah, yeah, I could see that out there. Uh, so we and don't organi- really need to be part of a big, huge organization to do that. No, no, you really don't. And and the organization I'm in, the Elysian Alliance, uh, they've got well, they can do pretty much anything. There's enough. There's <laughs> enough. There's enough people in there. To work things out so hopefully i mean to some degree like the organization that i'm in and the organization that the, the lightning's in uh hopefully we can get them to coordinate together so that's it can be a small little little alliance but nothing I, we're not, i'm not don't think either one of us are looking for anything too big so anyway so it's a good question it's a really deep question it really it is such a it is such a complex thing a lot of it's going to come down to the culture of star citizen but honestly, I, I think it might be safer just to stay solo until you see the, how the um, how things are flowing in the universe before you make a decision to jump into something. Because if 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 you, I think right now the current mentality of this big huge um, organization thing is is uh, chest, numbers chest bumping or whatever. Just yeah. like wow, look how many members we have. Yeah. So so that's why you're getting all these like, hey, join our thing. Like I got a couple things to join my thing, and as an individual, not even as a as a corporation or a organization or whatever. It's kind of like I don't care. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, let's move on to the next question from John D. Uh, he said, "AI turrets must be as accurate as possible." I don't want CIG to start going down a path where they artificially decrease the accuracy of supposedly super advanced futuristic auto turrets. I can understand that to a degree, but at the same time, you've got to look at gameplay. I mean, yes, we have turrets today that can shoot down missiles in flight as they're coming towards aircraft carriers, and that's what they use for defenses. Um, these like these high high rate of fire guns. A simple way to do it would just be make it a higher power requirement. Yeah. Because uh, when I was watching, the, you know, watch the video of those turrets. I mean, besides the 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 the, 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 the ammo shooting what at an angle way past what the barrel could move, um, <laughs> which was really weird. Uh, That's but been thing, a problem for a while. It has been, yeah. So, but the thing is that if you make things turrets too accurate, you you it is a, it's a matter of fine gameplay balance. It really is. Uh, for example, if AI turrets are ridiculously more accurate and ridiculously better than having a player or an NPC sitting in them then nobody's ever going to do that. That kind of defeats the whole multi-crew thing. So you, you have to have this, you have to have an incentive for, and it's, once again, he's talking about energy, like Lightning's talking about the energy and the power limits. Like if you have AI in there, it draws more energy. Maybe it's, maybe. <laughs> maybe uh, it's like that's... a 50% increase in energy draw. Yeah. I mean, so it's like, oh, well, maybe I really want to use physical then, but then you're limited by ammunition. So you have to be really careful on your engagements. Yeah. Where if you just have like a, a player or an NPC, you know, the, the, the player will be dictated by how good they are at the game anticipating um like movements and uh, the npc by the quality 
Yeah, an NPC would be, you know, by the... And of course you get to pay your NPC. Level. It's not just a one-time purchase like an AI. Yeah, so but, the AI purchase could be a lot more expensive, like even more expensive than like, you know, elite gunners. Right. Um, but the thing is like you buy that AI core and you're done. Um, but I mean, like if the just the turret gets destroyed, like the AI thing gets destroyed as well, where like a, uh, an NPC might just get injured. I mean, those are some pretty good ways. I think you could balance it just off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I don't and know that's what CIG wants to do. And that's the key thing, though, is balance. You can't make an option so good that it just overrides every other option, because then you end up once again with the meta. And if you have a game that's constantly being built around the meta. There's no purpose. There's no choice. Everyone's just going to stack the same crap and do the same thing. So, there's no variety. Yeah, there's absolutely no variety whatsoever. So while I get your concern there, I think top priority on this is gameplay. Um, that's first and foremost has to be gameplay. Otherwise, everything else just falls apart. And on the other side of the argument, you know, you can't have AI turrets that can't hit a target because then no one will want them. Exactly. There has to be that balance. You have to find out how to balance between uh, the average NPC skill, the player skill. It's going to take testing. And this is why, for the large part, I don't believe that we're going to see Squadron 42 this year. I think that uh, I think that there's we're getting close to having all those systems online. Uh, but the thing is, is that once we get all those online, they're going to have to do some serious testing. They're going to have to get metrics. They're going to have to get data. Like, how good are the NPCs? How good is the AI turrets? And how good are players? And they're going to have to, on, average, on an average basis, and they're going to have to try to balance that all off. And that's going to take that's going to take months of information gathering, research, and and time to get a good uh, good data set. You know, as far as statistics go, uh, the, the the bigger your sample, the better your 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 uh, your model is. And so, if you're only doing it for a week and testing, you know, that's not going to give you much. You have, because they're going to have to balance weapons and all that. So these these adjustments and these fluctuations, it's 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 going to be the hardest, probably as hard as it's been to build all the systems in the game. That point of balancing is probably going to be the most challenging thing that they've had to do. And I could see a lot of their resources going into it. Um, and it'll be an ongoing thing, too, as more stuff it will gets be. added. It'll be a constant thing. You're going to see patches for the game for balance for years to come. It's going to be little tweaks here, little tweaks there uh, as data sets change, as they look at things. Uh, but that's the nature. MMOs are never complete. They're always in development. Dracalicious. That's a good name. Uh, wrote... Um, Rar, nobody is flying my player. This is something I said about five minutes in. I can understand the mindset, but I fear the entire me, I'm the captain attitude that 90% of the player base uh, is going to have might in the end uh, doom these larger ships. I say this from tons of experience in space engineers. Good man. <laughs> People are using these massive ships solo instead of multi-crewing because they want to be the captain and don't want to work as a team. I feel this mindset, and again, it's an understandable mindset, will hurt large multi-crew ships at least as far as having real players on board is concerned, and not AI. It's like the ship game Black Wake. Everyone wants to fire the cannons and pilot the ship, yet no one wants to pump the water and fix holes. So many ships sink. You know, and I'm the weird guy in that. I am the guy who actually would want to pump pump the water and fix the holes. I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm the odd man out. I, when I say, like, no one's flying my Polaris, uh, I, maybe it's a, it a little harsh of a statement on that. Um, on my ship, I prefer sh fly a ship that, that, that I own, but I'm happily, I'm happy to serve on another person's ship. Uh, Lightning and I, we, and my brother, and, uh, we have ships that basically all complement one another, uh, or at least for the most part, fill in gaps that the other one doesn't have. And when it's their ship, you know, yeah, they can fly their ship, but that's absolutely awesome. And I will be happy to do whatever needs to be done, whether it's to engineer, uh, you know, uh, janitor, get the plunger and fix the toilet. <laughs> I, mean, I don't care what. Clog that toilet. <laughs> Whatever. <Vincent> Jarvis. <laughs> exactly. Or, or so crewman. There you crewman go. Crewman Jarvis. Exactly. It swabbed the deck. <laughs> um, but the point is, is that you know, but when it's my ship, here's the thing. This is the reason that I, I wouldn't want it. I would want to fly my Polaris, and, and even though it's a captain's chair, because if I crash it into something, it's my fault. I'm not going to be mad at somebody for for me flying badly. I, I one of the things I hate in games. Uh, is feeling resentful towards people I play with. So when it's something that's big and expensive in mine, I'm going to fly it because if I mess it up, then it's my fault and it's not their fault. And I don't, I won't have that get off my ship thing going on that sometimes you get when you play with people who constantly screw up. 
Get off my plane. Yeah, so, you know, I am I am absolutely happy to do whatever role is available. Um, I, 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 think, I think, but you're right, though. There are a lot of people... Uh, Lightning and I, well, we play Space Engineers too, and um, which just got a huge update for um, multi-thread. I've been meaning to check it out. Yeah, so we we have a tendency to make big ships. In fact, I had a video on here for fun where we crashed some of my my big ships with like three. It has oh, a yeah. after the planet it has it has a three decks of of uh, of hangar bays, and we crashed it on a planet for fun. And it that was, was like a giant zeppelin. Yeah, yeah that's in our on our channel in the, the fun video section. And yeah, he called. Looks like those, those look like that example, was actually. that was before I had my new computer. Yeah, and uh, I think yours rendered like ninety percent of it. Mm-hmm. While all I got it was, oh, we're getting closer to the ground, and then the game just froze for me <laughs> as all the physics calculations went off, and it was like, oh, I think my game crashed, and, and Jarvis is like, oh, the humanity, and I was like, <laughs> I can't see what's even going on, and then like all rendered in in like you know two seconds on my screen, which is blah, yeah. blah blah blah. And it's like holy crap but you know we, we have a tendency to make really big obnoxious ships and because we like to have the all-in-one super ship you know it does everything yeah uh, but at the in same time engineers that's yeah. kind of what you want yeah but but uh, like a lot of times there's other games uh it was imperion galactic survival or which just got an update it's, it's also got an update yeah with six, atmospheres six point oh now oh, yeah that, oh, that's that's a, that. if you like space engineers by the way check that game out it's fantastic you can get it on steam um the thing is is that uh uh, that one, I because I think it's in some regards, its systems, its limitation, the way they force force limitations on you, creates a better sense of design. Like I made that very small jump ship, but it's it's so small, it's as small as you can about make it to be able to jump to other planets, and it runs out of fuel like after one jump. <laughs> Well, you might be happy now because they've changed the way that the fuel stuff works. Yeah, yeah, but I'm still saying that the way that the way that they design things with the mass and things like that—it's more limitations, but it creates a sense of realism. So the point is that you you build more specialized ships in in, in that one, and, and I don't mind the the, uh, the the specializations and stuff like that. So the point is is that you know we we build ships even in there that like oh okay, I'm making a mining ship and where do you make I'm making a manufacturing ship and 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 then we like to go ahead and and do those particular tasks so i i don't think that Mine everyone always end up being some sort of carrier <laughs> yes yeah i know what they do uh but you know for me i think that you know is that just my mindset as an older player i tend to look at just participating i don't always have to be you know the cock of the walk you know for it, it, it's just well like in in gta and stuff like when i summon up the valkyrie yeah um you're always on the the nose gun and you've had a lot of experience in that nose gun and you're really really good at it and you've always flown with me like with me as the pilot so you know how i fly and it makes a really really good dynamic uh and that's just two people i mean granted if we had four people we'd have too many guns and i'd have to fly a little bit different yeah. but um you know yeah i, I usually fly the helicopters just because i've had more practice at it and then there's the driving and stuff but you tend to be a better shot than me yeah so I mean, you just gotta find what you're good at. But I would, I would love to in Star Citizen run around as an engineer and fix ships inside. I, I think that I would love to give that a try. It's a different kind of gameplay, and uh, it was that comes down to pacing. They gotta make the pacing work, otherwise it doesn't matter. So we'll see what happens with that. All right, K bomb one two three. The issue with Lightning Dragons worry about destroying beacons is like worrying that pirates are gonna destroy. NOAA buoys in the ocean. The buoys are so small and the ocean is so large they're nearly impossible to find if you don't know where to look for them. I don't see a beacon about as big as a suitcase or a, a steamer trunk being that easy to find in deep space. Except for in space, there's scanners. Yeah, well, I can definitely understand that too. I mean, we'll have to see how the whole beacon thing comes out. Uh, as far as you know, people trolling them or destroying them or going after them. Uh, or even just salvaging them, <laughs> just to be a dick. Um, but you know, <laughs> my beacon now. <laughs> my beacon now. Um, I, I see you with a, your reclaimer, the big arm. Crunch my beacon. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, we'll have to see how the mechanic comes out for scanning and things like that. Uh, it could be easy. It could be hard. And then of course you got the player dynamics of, of how people are. I mean, how people on the internet are. So I guess we'll just have to see. I hope they make it hard because unless you have the exact frequency or the exact um, uh, honing in exactly the, the, the frequency of the signal to know exactly where it is, I hope they do make it difficult. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of shenanigans. And speaking of shenanigans, 
Citizen Shenanigans asks. <laughs> How appropriate. That is the ultimate segue. Um, what if there are so many encrypted signals going everywhere from beacons, from common stations, from ships, from stations, etc., you won't easily know which is worth hacking? Maybe the beacon's coordinates and all relevant info is encrypted, and the location of said beacon can only be derived from triangulation if you're not sure which signal to hack. Both triangulation and hacking should be intricate and skill-based. So, if you don't physically happen upon a beacon, you won't necessarily know it's there. People should hide beacons if they don't uh, want, them, uh, want them happened upon. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely you shouldn't just like, have your beacon sitting out in the open. Uh, I mean, because yeah, it's, it's worse to space and then yeah, it's pretty much out in the open. Is, you know... 90% empty or 99.999% emptiness yeah like if you're down on a plant waiting rescue and you're dropping a beacon you should probably put it like behind like climb up on put, a, it, put it underneath a rock yeah or, or climb up on a hill and put it on top of a, a hard reach location or something like that you know yeah definitely don't want to just leave it out in the open um see talk about the derived from triangulation when I was much younger uh, I was in the Civil Air Patrol and we learned to use the ELTs, the Emergency Locator Transmitters. And that's we use triangulation to try to determine uh, uh, where a plane has gone down. So I get the idea of, of, of if they use something similar to that, it's not exactly precise. It's one of those things that you have to, uh, when you're out in the field, you have to move a good amount of, a good amount of distance away to get another reading to, and then basically mark it on the map. You're trying to zero in and it could take quite some time to find something uh and depending upon the terrain and depending upon you know the foliage and things like that it could be really difficult now obviously space doesn't have foliage and things but you could have asteroid fields and other things like that so also the habit yeah nebulas all sorts of things could be playing with those signals um or, re or refracting them or even bouncing them off other objects so there's all sorts of ways that they can they can play with that um Overall, I'd say it's a good idea, though. Yeah, and it should actually be intricate. It should be skill-based. And it should be something that a more player does it, the, maybe the better he gets at it. and Or at least because in real-world sense, not just because he's got a stat, you know? <laughs> yeah, not, not like a stat that levels up. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Like, I, oh, well, you know, this this pinged here and it, it pinged over here when I scan this other location. Uh, and, you know, the last ten times I've done scanning, that usually means it's about here. So if I go here, I can get a more detailed scan than if I just went here or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely I definitely want to see that to be deep. I really do. And that's from just basing it on my real world experience. All right. And a question from Macho All Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I see that Macho Man. Um, what if you move the bacon to set up an ambush instead of destroying it? That's I'm sorry, not I'm... how you spell bacon. <laughs> I know he went beacon, but he said bacon. And the reason I'm keeping it that way is Champions Online. The bacon is down. <laughs> <laughs> it became kind of a meme for that game. The opening thing you had to the turn on these beacons. The bacons are down. <laughs> <laughs> they, they did fix it eventually. But. I know, but it said bacon for the longest time, and it was so funny. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the, the bacons. Um, yeah, I like that. The idea of uh, moving the beacon to set up an ambush. That is actually a very smart, something I hadn't considered. Uh, if you do find one, I could just see that as, a, or you, you could just camp it out, you know, like, okay, well, clearly, you know, this has got a lot of power. Someone's coming out here soon, you know, and you just, you, you all move to it like an out of, out of distance location, like from a good distance away. Then you have like your Terrapin or whatnot scanning down the area passively. When people jump in, you pounce. That's a really a piratey kind of thing to do. And you don't know what you're stepping into anyway. You could be like ready to pounce yeah, and two, and like, two Idris's jump in. Yeah, <laughs> an Idris and a Bengal carrier word, but you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you're really rolling the dice on that one. But yeah, you could have fun. You could have some fun with that. Make for an interesting video. And the bacons are still down. <laughs> Sergeant Acid. He says, I would honestly think slash hope that destroying a player's beacon would come with a bounty or negative reputation. If not in the first iteration, then sometime after if trolling becomes a widespread public issue. Yes, I could see that, but if they have a bounty system, it needs to have some logic behind it. Like, uh, 
what we was played... it? Um, Arc Age? Yes, Arc Age had like, okay, I see footprints. I, so I stole it from this bush out in the middle of nowhere. Oh, man. You, you stole got a bounty. From this bush. Nice yeah. Bounty. No one was there to see me steal right. from the bush. Exactly. So therefore, I shouldn't have a bounty. Oh, right. But there was footprints left in the ground. Someone saw the footprints. Whoop de doo. They found footprints. It's not like other people walked in the uh, area. So do I stamp my name at the bottom of my shoes? They just read it off the, off the footprints? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And while I do agree that there needs to be some kind of reason to discourage trolling, it, yeah, I agree that it has to make sense. It's not like, yeah. aha, I blew up this beacon in the middle of space, which has no way to transmit its information. Unless that's something you can put on your beacon. It's like, say, for example, you can get a bigger beacon that's a little bit easier to detect, but it has like a two-way radio on there. And uh, what it can do is it can take like a flash scan of your ship. So you'll get like maybe your I, um, IFF code or, or something like that. So like, boom, you've been like the, the speed cameras, right? Yeah. So it's like you blew it up, it, it sent off the thing, you know, as a, a you know, it's like a hardened box or something. It's like, I've been destroyed, and it was done by this ship. Um, so that'd be something that they could do um, if you wanted to spend extra money on it, if you were worried about that kind of stuff, like if you were in hostile space. Yeah, and that's a possibility. But yeah, it shouldn't, it shouldn't just happen arbitrarily. I hate mechanics that just, oh, you're guilty because even though there was no witnesses around, somehow we figured out that you did it because reasons. Magic. Magic. Yeah. I, I, we, the Star Citizen, they can do better than that. But I, I don't, I'm not I'm not in disagreement that there should actually be a bounty or negative reputation for beacon destruction uh, somehow in the game. But as Lightning said, it should be depending upon if, if the information was relayed or not. And and that that's, that's so important. Otherwise, we get into magic land and I really just don't want that for the game. All right, Michael Roach here. I think this is our last question here. Nope, nope, got nope, one more after this. one more. <laughs> it's only going to be a long episode. It is. Uh, response to Nav Beacon's opinion and conjecture. Well, the black boxes in the ICC missions are effectively a type of Nav Beacon. So I'm guessing the size would be comparable. So picture something that size, but without the blinking light. I hope it doesn't have a blinking light. Those things are bright. Those are Atta annoying. <laughs> Attached, and you only get the location if you had the frequency. So they might have to stumble across something the size of a cigar box floating in an asteroid belt. Pretty unlikely. Now, if you put it someplace more conspicuous, maybe it's easier to find, like on a desktop or an abandoned outpost. Another possibility is that special sensors might factor in as well. A properly equipped ship might have a sensor ray that can detect other people's beacons, ones they don't have the codes for. Yeah, something like a Cutlass Red. You know, it's a rescue ship. It's a search and rescue ship. I could see them having... Um, That's actually a good point. You know, I didn't think about that. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's like, like if 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 a, I think ships that are that that maybe that are marked as rescue ships will have special licensed equipment that will maybe bypass, and that of course that gives the option that we're stealing that equipment or or. or uh, I don't know about special equipment, but maybe well tuned like, sensors. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, I mean, like. Oh, we have you. Know, you like they they have a, a particular kind of uh, box. It, you, it, it's 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 not just tied to the ship, but it's a box, and you have to have. Oh, we 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 are licensed to search and rescue, and then you're able to utilize certain equipment. Like like certain equipment isn't sold without a license or something like that. Uh, but then again, like I said that equipment can be stolen. You could be like, hey, your ship can be disabled. Some guy comes in. I'm taking this box so I can find this. You know, whatever. I don't know, and that's a possibility. I mean, who knows. But, and that'll but, actually be a thing when they uh, get all the IVE system in. Yeah, I mean, there's got to be something that uh, for the rescue ships that make them different. I mean, otherwise they're not gonna they're not gonna be able to uh, find oh. anybody to save them. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be much more much harder. They should have something. Um, but you're right about the size. I mean, if they are the same size we're seeing in those ICC missions, uh, that's that is pretty small. And that's that's something I was thinking about. And they said, but they said that at the same time deploying mines, and I was just like. How big are these things? <laughs> I don't know. Well, let's but, see. A uh, ship mine is enough to disable a ship, and they're, what, like three feet in height yeah. sometimes? Well, you know, the, the thing is that, you know, things change in size all the time. And this, well, I have two, item system 2.0 coming in. Uh, some of these things are refactored, and we're going to have to see exactly how these things come out. I mean, what we have in the, in the ICC missions right now very much just might be a placeholder. You know, like, oh, yeah, this is a box. It's... You know, it, it, it's, it took him five minutes to make it. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, there we go. It's a mission. So it's one of those things that, you know, what we may see next might completely be different. We'll see. 
but yeah, I, I'd hope that there'd be special sensors on that. I, I, I really hope that they give those that you know, you take you take a um, uh, a career path as search and rescue, whatever ship you have. Whether you can be a Connie and do search and rescue, it doesn't matter. But I think it should be just a path you have. You get you get a certain amount of trust with an organization. They open up the possibility for you doing search and rescue for that organization because they trust you. Because search and rescue shouldn't just be open for anybody. Because that doesn't make sense. Well, it takes some trust to do that kind of thing. And then you basically go down. You get you get the special package like, hey, these these are able to detect our beacons if they're in distress. And then you're able to go out and get missions and do work along those lines. Or maybe just stumble across one accidentally. I don't know. It'd be interesting. There's all sorts of possibilities out there. But I like the idea. All right. So we'll wrap this one up here with Michael Ratswallow. Mm. <laughs> that sounds delicious. <laughs> um, with item 2.0 allowing gases to be introduced into the game via atmosphere and having the gas affect your stamina and other effects, my question is, if you fart in your suit, will it kill you? <laughs> it, well, it depends. If it's me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't think. I, I think. But what? But you do kind of. It kind of brings up an interesting thought. Like if you were to seal up a suit in a toxic environment, like say, like you're in a toxic environment and you try to get into a suit real quick, and and, and you just you you've sealed up the suit. How much of that toxin is inside the suit you've sealed up with you? Or how much oxygen was wasted to get rid of it? Yeah, exactly. So what I'm wondering is like, well, will that be a factor? That's, in a sense, that's that's kind of why I was looking at that one because I was thinking about the suit thing, and you know, there's gonna be times where you know you're gonna be um, needing to emergency equip something because of some sort of toxic gas leak, and if you seal it in with you, what have you you know what have you really done? It has to be a way to vent that out. It has to be a way to deal with that. I mean, and that, that depends if they actually figure that into the game but if they allow for percent based uh, things like you know oxygen and hydrogen or whatever yeah um i i think that would allow certain things like for example let's say you're inside of a station um and you don't have your suit on because you don't need your suit on because you're in this big huge station and they have like uh, it gets attacked or something and one of the cooling tanks or whatever uh ruptures and then uh fills up an area with you know whatever percentage of this hostile gas um going in there uh it might like lower your stamina as well as like drain your hit points because you are not getting enough oxygen into your blood um in the in the realistic term in the game setting it'd be like whatever percent it is like let's say it's 50 50 so you know it doesn't just kill you outright but it's like you can only be in there for so long yeah i guess we're going to see a lot more of the atmosphere features coming out in 3.0 so we'll see how that starts to come into play and of course there'll be more tweaks down the road uh with that system as well so i am curious to see how that does work out especially when it comes to suits i know you're going to have those depressurization they've already shown that several times so that means it is taking account of the gases in your suit so uh, uh, uh be kind and and and, and, and don't please rewind yeah that too <laughs> All right, guys. So I think that wraps up everything on this extremely long episode of Citizens Corner. Um, didn't realize the first question would take nearly as long as it did, but it was a good, really good That's question. That's because we got into story time. That's true. We did. We did get story time. So, anyway, guys, uh, we will catch you on the blast cast, and we will let you go about your day. Uh, without... Hopefully, you you watch it all the way to the end. If you hopefully didn't appreciate it. it. Yeah, exactly. All right, guys. We'll catch you later. <laughs>